Hello and welcome back. In this video, I want to discuss the type of motion that a mass experiences when the mass is attached to a spring that has either been stretched or compressed. Now, in this figure down here, I show a mass that's attached to a spring, and this spring has been compressed by pushing this mass to the left. So in this case, delta x points to the left. Now, recall from the previous video, the force is exerted by the spring always points in the opposite direction as delta x. So here, the spring has been compressed by pushing it to the left, so the spring force will point to the right. Now, according to Newton's second law, the force that is exerted on the mass will equal to its mass times acceleration. So because the spring force points to the right, this mass is going to accelerate to the right. And as the mass moves to the right, the distance that the spring has been stretched will become smaller and smaller. So the acceleration that's pushing this mass to the right will become smaller and smaller. But the important thing to see is the acceleration is always going to be pointing to the right. Now eventually the mass will return back to its equilibrium position. But at this point the mass is now moving to the right. So the mass has a very large velocity that points to the right. So as a result, even though there's no net force on the mass when it reaches equilibrium, because the mass is now moving to the right, it will move past its equilibrium position. Now, as the mass moves past its equilibrium position, it begins to stretch out the spring, so the spring will now point to the right. Now, because the spring is being stretched, so delta x points to the right, the spring force now will point to the left. So the mass will now experience an acceleration that points to the left. This acceleration will cause the mass to slow down, and eventually the mass will come to rest. However, when the mass comes to rest, the spring is still stretched, and the mass therefore still has an acceleration that points to the left. So the mass will then begin to accelerate back towards its equilibrium position. However, just like before, because the acceleration always points to the left, the mass, when it reaches its equilibrium position, will now have a velocity that points to the left. So as a result, the mass will now pass through its equilibrium position and begin moving to the left. As the mass moves to the left, delta x points to the left, so the spring force will have to point to the right. This means that the mass will be accelerating to the right, and so as a result, eventually, the mass will come back to rest. At this point, we've now returned back to our starting point, where the mass has compressed the spring, and the mass is initially at rest. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this motion would actually look like. So in this slide here, I have this little animation that I got from Brigham Young, and it just shows the motion of an object that's attached to a spring. So we can see the mass is just going to move back and forth like this, over and over again. And this type of motion is called simple harmonic motion, and I'll frequently abbreviate this as SHM. So if I plot the position of the object versus time, I'll get something that looks like this. It'll just be this curve, and it'll be centered around the equilibrium position for the mass. So now at this point, I'd like to come up with a way to qualitatively describe the motion of an object that's undergoing simple harmonic motion. And there are two things that we can look at. The first is the maximum distance that the object will move from its equilibrium position. And this is called the amplitude of its motion, which is denoted with a capital A. The second is the amount of time that it takes for the object to undergo one full oscillation. And this is called the period of the motion, which is denoted with a capital T. So now I'd like to come up with a way to actually mathematically describe this motion. So in other words, I want to come up with a formula for the position of the object versus time. And before I do this, I want to point out that just looking at this graph, we can see that the graph is in the shape of a sine or a cosine function. So this is where we're going to start. So on the left here, I want to show graph of position versus time. So position versus time maybe looks something like this. And I'm going to compare this to the graph of sine of x. So we have y is equal to sine of x. And this is going to look something like this. So just looking at these two graphs, we can see that they're extremely similar. But there's some differences. For example, for a simple harmonic motion, the maximum and minimum value uh, for the x value is equal to 
plus my amplitude and minus the amplitude. And sine has a maximum value that's equal to plus one and a minimum value that's equal to minus one. So the first thing we have to figure out is how you stretch or compress this graph in the y direction so that the sine will have a maximum value that's equal to the amplitude. So if you recall from your previous algebra classes, the way that you stretch or compress a graph in the y direction is you multiply the whole thing by a constant. So in this case, I want the maximum value to be equal to the amplitude. Since the maximum value of sine is equal to one, if I multiply sine by the amplitude, the maximum value will be equal to my amplitude, which is what I want. So we could write this maybe as something like a times the sine of t. I want to point out before I even go any further, I could argue from dimensional analysis alone that I have to have something multiplying the sine. Recall that sine and cosine are always unitless. So I have to have something of units of distance multiplying sine because I'm setting it equal to my position. And remember the units have to be equal on both sides. So position versus time, position has units of distance. This thing on the right has to have units of distance. So I have to multiply sine by something that has units of distance. And amplitude, of course, has units of distance. Now the other thing that's not gonna be the same with these two graphs is the amount of time it takes, or the amount that this thing changes by, during one full oscillation. So for a simple harmonic oscillator, t changes by one period during one oscillation. For sine, the value of x changes by 2 pi during one oscillation. So what I need to do in order to make this work is I have to multiply t by something which I'm going to call omega. This is a Greek letter, lowercase omega. I'm going to multiply t by omega inside the sign here. And what I need to do is I need to figure out what omega is so that this whole thing is going to uh, undergo one full oscillation when t changes by an amount that's equal to my period. So let's think about this. If the argument inside sine changes by 2 pi, then this whole thing will undergo one oscillation. Right? That's, what, that's what we're seeing here. When x changes by 2 pi, we see one full oscillation. So if t inside here changes by my period, then this whole thing needs to change by 2 pi. So in other words, I need omega times my period to equal 2 pi. So omega is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. So I could write the position of the object versus time like this. It's the amplitude times the sine of 2 pi t divided by my period. And this omega that I've written down here is called the angular frequency of the oscillator. So this omega that appears in this equation is called the angular frequency. And basically what omega measures is it measures the number of radians that the argument of the sine or cosine undergoes or changes by in one second. So now at this point we have two different ways that we can describe the time dependence of a harmonic oscillator. We can talk about the period of the oscillator and we can talk about the angular frequency of the oscillator. There's one other thing that we can use to describe the time dependence of the oscillator and this is the frequency. So the frequency is the number of oscillations that the oscillator will undergo in one second. So how do we calculate the frequency? Well, let's consider a simple example. If an object takes one half of a second to undergo one full oscillation, we can ask how many oscillations does the uh, oscillator undergo in one second? Well, if it takes half of a second for it to undergo one oscillation, then the oscillator will undergo two oscillations in one second. So here we saw the number of oscillations. Let me write this out actually. So the number of oscillations was equal to one oscillation divided by 0 0.5 seconds times one second. 
So if the object takes t seconds to undergo one oscillation, remember t is the period, it's the number of seconds for one oscillation, we could ask, well, how many oscillations will the oscillator complete in one second? And in this case, it's the same thing, right? The number of oscillations is equal to one oscillation divided by t seconds times one second. Or, actually, the number of oscillations per second is just equal to one oscillation divided by t. So in general, the frequency, which is the number of oscillations per second, is equal to one divided by the period. Now I should point out at this point that frequency will have units of one divided by time, because time has units of seconds. And we call this, one divided by time, we call this a hertz. So one over seconds is called hertz. And people will sometimes call hertz, instead of it one divided by time, they might say cycles per second. So this is why, for example, processors, we usually talk about them in terms of you know, megahertz or gigahertz. What we're actually saying is we're saying the number of calculations that the processor can complete in one second. So it's the number of cycles per second. So here I have six equations, and I'm just showing all the different ways that we could relate these three different variables, the period, frequency, and angular frequency. Now, you don't have to me memorize all six of these equations. In fact, I would really discourage you from doing that. Uh, all you have to do is know two equations that involve all three of these variables, and then you can rearrange those two equations to get all of these other equations. Here I've just solved for the period, frequency, and angular frequency in terms of the other two variables, but you don't have to know all of these equations. Just pick two. So let's go ahead and take a look at one example. This example says, a diaphragm in a speaker is driven with an angular frequency a 7.54 times 10 to the 4 radians per second. And we're asked how many oscillations this diaphragm undergo in 2.5 seconds. So let me write down our known and our unknown variables. So omega is equal to 7.54 times 10 to the 4th radians per second. And you'll sometimes see me use units of radians per second to describe angular frequency, just so I know I'm talking about an angular frequency and not a regular frequency. So we were given the angular frequency, we were told the amount of time is 2.5 seconds, and what we're trying to solve for are the number of oscillations. So the number of oscillations that the, uh, that the diaphragm undergoes is equal to the number of oscillations that it experiences per second times delta t. And the number of oscillations per second, remember that that's equal to the frequency. So the number of oscillations is equal to frequency times delta t. Now in this case, I wasn't given frequency, I was only given angular frequency. So I need to figure out a way to relate these two things. Now recall from earlier in the video, I found that omega was equal to 2 pi divided by t. I also said that frequency is equal to 1 over t. So looking at these two equations, we can see that omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. So frequency is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. So this is the way I would normally solve these types of problems. Like I said, I don't think it's a very good idea to try to sit down and memorize all six of these equations. Here I just started with two equations. These were the two first equations that I showed you for angular frequency and for frequency respectively. And then I just used these two equations to figure out how to write frequency and angular frequency, or how to relate frequency and angular frequency. So now that I have this expression, I can plug this into this formula here, and I see the number of oscillations will equal omega times delta t divided by 2 pi. So if I plug all this into a calculator, I see the number of oscillations will be equal to 3.0 times 10 to the 4. 
So at this point, I think I'd like to end this video. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about how we relate the amplitude and frequency to the maximum velocity and acceleration that an object will experience when it's undergoing simple harmonic motion.